I've said it before, there's no pain like family pain. Today on Through the Bible, we'll get a look at life behind the door of a troubled home. Welcome to another great study in God's Word with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We're beginning in Genesis 25, verse 28, so turn there if you can. If you're a parent, then you know it's one of the most difficult roles in life. You need God's wisdom every day, both for the big and small decisions surrounding how to raise your kids right, especially if you want to help them walk with the Lord. Well, in our study of Genesis 27, we'll learn one thing that we should not do from Isaac and Rebekah because it leads to disastrous long-term hurt. So as you find your place in the scriptures, let me share this letter with you from a fellow passenger in Bronx, New York, who writes, I'm writing to retain my seat on the Bible bus. Though I've been aboard for more than three complete trips, I discover something new each time I travel with you. I thank God for initiating this program, Dr. McGee for his uncommon wisdom in implementing it, and you guys who continue where he left for your faithfulness in getting the whole word to the whole world. I listen on WMCA at 5.45 a.m. and on my iPod all the time. Let me tell you how God has converted this technology into such a wonderful tool. I am sending one to everyone in my family, loaded with Through the Bible lessons and Christian music, praying that God himself will minister to them through these messages. Until you reach my bus station again, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, that's one creative dad, isn't it? And we can learn a lesson from his purposeful generosity. And by the way, his example of how he's using technology is just one way among many. You can find many different ways to hop aboard the Bible bus over at ttb.org. You know, one very easy way to have the complete five-year program, that's over 1,300 lessons, by the way, literally in the palm of your hand, is to get the Bible bus flash drive. You'll find that at ttb.org, too. Or just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll tell you more about how you can get it. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to your word today willing to hear from you. So open our eyes to your truths. Draw those who don't know you to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, our study brings us to the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis. And if you have your Bible and will turn there, It'll make it more meaningful to you, and if you use our notes and follow along with them. Now, this chapter has as its theme Jacob and Rebekah conniving to get the blessing of Isaac for Jacob, which blessing old Isaac intended for Esau. But you see, Jacob wanted the blessing of his father, and he knew God had promised his mother that the elder would serve the younger, and the blessing was his already. He did not believe God. Rebekah's mother did not believe God. And evidently, Isaac, the father, didn't believe God. He would never have attempted to bypass Jacob and to give the blessing to Esau. He followed his feelings and appetite in contradiction to the distinct word of God. The method of Jacob in obtaining this birthright, it cannot be supported on any grounds whatsoever. He used fraud and deceit. His conduct is despicable. You can't condone him at all any more than you could condone the conduct of Sarah and Abraham in the matter of Hagar and Ishmael. God could not use the trickery and cleverness of Jacob. And we're going to see that God deals with this man in a very definite way. He's going to pay Jacob for his sin in the same coin in which he sinned. And you will note that as we get now into this chapter here. That gives us preliminary that will enable us to understand. Now, last time we concluded in chapter 26 by seeing that Esau was about 40 years old, and he took to wife a Hittite, and it was a great grief to Isaac and Rebekah for him to do that. And now they recognize that if Jacob is not to marry a Hittite or a Philistine, that he must be sent down just as Isaac got a bride from the family of Abraham, that is, from the same stock. Now will you notice chapter 27, verse 1. It came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, 
he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. Now, this man Isaac, we've already seen. He was an outstanding man, a great man. He's no weakling by any means because we saw in the last chapter that Abimelech and the Philistines, they wanted to make a treaty with him because they feared him. And he was that type of a man. That is, he was an outstanding man of that day, very prominent. Now, he reveals here, though, that weakness of the flesh. All during his life, this boy Esau, and Esau was his favorite, and Jacob was the favorite of Rebekah, and Esau was the outdoor boy, and he'd go out and he'd bring in a deer or some animal and he'd fix it, barbecue it for his father, and the old man enjoyed it. And now he's old, and he wants to bless the boy. Now, he knows God is said. The elder will serve the younger, but he bypasses that because he wants to bless the boy. And he says, now go out and bring me in something and I'll bless you because of it. My, what a revelation this is of this family. And have you noticed the strife that's in the family since we have come into this last major section of Genesis? There was strife in the family of Abraham because of Hagar. There's strife now in this family, these twins. Now, will you notice, Rebekah overheard that. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went into the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Now, this is the plot and plan of Rebekah. And it's deceit. It's absolutely trickery. And it cannot be condoned on any basis whatsoever. And God's recording it as history, not that he condones it. He condemns it. And we're going to see that. You remember the things that are being done here. And you'll see chickens come home to roost for Jacob. Now she says to him, you obey me, you go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he love it, and thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Now, he was not only uh, an outdoor man, red man, but he was a hairy man. He was, I would think, the first hippie that there was. He grew hair everywhere, and I'm a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. Well, not only seem a deceiver, he is a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son, only obey my voice, and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, put upon Jacob her younger son, and she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hand and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she'd prepared under the hand of her son Jacob. And friends, I can't help but comment on this. Now, she put the skin of the kid of the goat on the back of his neck and on the back of his hand. So when his father would feel him, why, he'd think that it was Esau. Not only did he feel him, friends, he couldn't help but smell him. And I want to say that apparently the deodorant that Esau was using was not very potent at all. fact of the matter is, I think he's like the whimsical story I heard about two men working in a very tight place, and one of them finally said to the other, and he says, I think that the deodorant of one of us has quit working. And the other fellow says, must be you, because I don't use any. And friends, I don't think 
that Esau used any. And I'm not sure that he had a shower very often. This man not only felt hairy, but he smelt like a hippie too, by the way. May I say you can't help but notice that as you go through here. And the thing that happened now, he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who art thou, my son? The voice was not quite the voice of Esau. Everything else, it was like Esau. And Jacob said unto his father, I'm Esau thy firstborn. I've done according as thou baddest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And believe me, this boy at this particular point is a typical pious fraud. And you find many of them today in fundamental circles. They talk about the Lord leading them. And sometimes the Lord leads them to do some very unusual things. I find out sometimes a Christian man can do things that if the mafia did it, and the mafia does things like that, why the mafia would be arrested for it. But they very piously pray about it and say it's the Lord's will. I'm not always sure about that. And believe me, this boy, Jacob, at this point is a pious fraud because the Lord thy God brought it to me. The Lord had nothing to do with this, friends. Verse 21, And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. Isaac suspicioned something. But you see, Rebekah knew Isaac very well, and she had worked this thing out. And so Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And I think also the odor was too. I don't think there's any question about that. The hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hand. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I'll eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. He came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment. I told you that was there, friends. And blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Now he's giving a blessing he had received. He's passing it on, but the interesting thing is it already was Jacob's. God had said that. God had already blessed, and God is not accepting this at all. You can write that down. Now, let me read verse 30. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat, brought it unto his father, and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I'm thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who, where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I've eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him, yea, and he shall be blessed. And somebody says, well, does venison taste like goat or lamb? It sure does. I remember several years ago that when I was pastor in Pasadena at one of the offices there, he and I went deer hunting up in Utah, and we got a deer, but wasn't enough to feed the congregation. We invited them in for a venison dinner, and it was just a time of good, wholesome fellowship. And we had a lot of fun, but we didn't have enough to go around. So we got two lamb legs, and that was cooked also. And nobody could tell the difference. Everybody said the venison is good. It tastes very much alike. Now, Isaac really sees he's been taken in. 
And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? And he was a usurper. For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, and by thy sword shalt thou live and shall serve thy brother. It shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. In other words, my father's old. He won't live very much longer. And just soon as my father dies, I'll kill Jacob. I'll get rid of him. And that was the thought in the heart of Esau. Now, Rebekah's in the background. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee to comfort himself purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother in Haran. You see here again, Rebekah taking things in her own hands, and she tells Jacob now, you're going to have to leave home, and she's going to send him away from home. Tell the truth, she really paid for her part in this, her sin. She never saw this boy alive again. She just sent him over there for a little while, but she died before he got back. And you must remember that Jacob was her favorite and that Esau was Isaac's favorite. And she wants to send him now over to Laban, her brother. And Jacob will go over there. And believe me, that's where he's going to learn his lesson. That's where chickens will come home to roost. Old Uncle Laban is going to put him in school. And he's going to teach him a few things. Now, Jacob thought he was clever, but Uncle Laban was an expert at it. And poor Jacob was just an amateur. And he's going to cry out in desperation to God before it's all over. Now, notice what she says. Tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. A few days, a few days lengthened out to 20 years. And during that interval, why, she died. She never saw her boy again, her favorite, her pet, if you please. Now, verse 45, Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? And after all, Esau's not going to think too much of his mother after this little episode, by the way. Now we read here, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Now, you see, Esau had married these heathen, the godless, and already it was bringing Sarah into the home, and even Rebekah was overwhelmed by it. Now, she says if Jacob turns around and does this same thing, and he probably will if he stays here, you see, she could use this as an excuse to get Jacob away from the home because Esau is seeking for his life. And that moves us now into chapter 28. And she has a little conference with Isaac. 
And Rebekah and Isaac determined now that the thing to do is to send Jacob back to the family of Laban, back where Rebekah had come from herself, you see. Abraham's servant had gone and gotten her. Now the point is to send Jacob back there to get a wife. If you get him away from the place of danger, his brother would try to kill him. Now, very frankly, I think if he'd stayed there, that probably that would have happened. However, the fact of the matter is that Rebecca died first, and Jacob did get back for his father's funeral. Now you find in chapter 28, and I'm reading now verse 1 of chapter 28, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. All the way through the Old Testament, you find that God does not want the godly to marry the ungodly. And that, again, is my reason for believing that in the 6th of Genesis, that all you have when the sons of God looked upon the daughters of men, it's the godly line marrying with the godless line of Cain, which finally brought the judgment of the flood and only one man left. Now, that in a marriage always leads to godlessness. And I'd say this word just of caution. I recognize we're living in a day when young people are not apt to take advice from certainly an old preacher. They say, my, what does he know? And if you really want to know the truth, I know a whole lot about this particular matter. I have seen case after case where some little girl or some little boy, they come to counsel, well, I've met a fellow, he's not a Christian, I'm going with him, and he's proposed to me, and I think I'm going to marry him, and I can win him for the Lord. And little girl, if you can't win him before you get married, you'll never win him after you get married. You can be sure of that. Same thing at hold for the young man, and God forbids it. It always entails sorrow. I have seen literally hundreds of cases and I've never yet seen a case where it worked. Never yet. You can't beat God. God is put down too indelibly all the way through the word. When the godly marry the godless, what happens? Look at Ahab and Jezebel. And in the New Testament, it's strictly told Christians that they are not to be unequally yoked. And that's the way you get unequally yoked, not by just sitting on the platform of somebody, but by intermarrying. That's the way you join up with them, by the way, and that is the thing that is going to happen. Now, Isaac sends Jacob away. He says, Arise, go to Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father. Take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. I sends him back to Laban. And believe me, old Laban is quite a trickster himself. And Jacob is in for it. I can tell him that right now, but he doesn't know it. But he's sure going to find out about it. And we're going to have to wait till next time to find out about it. And I trust that you'll be with us. Let us hear from you, friends. So until next time, my beloved, may God richly bless you. More family pain. We'll pick up here tomorrow when we'll learn how Jacob's tricks brought consequences. You know, it makes me think of Galatians 6, verse 7. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows. That will he also reap. May God help us learn these lessons here and now as we apply his word to our own lives. If you want to spend more time in the lessons that we've been studying, visit our website at ttb.org where they're available anytime. Or as I mentioned at the beginning of the study, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE to purchase the Bible Bus flash drive that includes all of Dr. McGee's five-year studies, more than a hundred of Dr. McGee's booklets, and all of his notes and outlines to help us go deeper as we travel through God's Word. Again, that number is 1-800-65-BIBLE, or write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And when you're in touch, be sure to let us know how you listen to Through the Bible. As we've said before, this little bit of info really helps us evaluate how we're stewarding the resources that God provides through faithful friends like you. Now, as Dr. McGee said today, let us hear from you. You know we love to hear how God is at work in your life through our studies together. Now, on Monday, we'll continue our journey in the book of Genesis as we meet up with Jacob 
when God stops him in his tracks at Bethel. Go ahead and read through Genesis 28 a couple of times yourself. It's a great story of God's mercy. I'm Steve Sweats, and I'll see you here then. Keep walking in the light of his word. Jesus made it Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?